What you can't hear is the music that's playing, which is kind of like some sort of a 90s house mix that's been playing the whole time over the last two days and last night. So I think I'm gonna be hearing that for the rest of my life. But it does wanna get, get me up and have a bit of a dance. Uh, you might notice I've got a National Science T-shirt, National Science Week T-shirt on, and I think that's something we can do as groups, as community groups, connect with activities, connect with publicly active events and promotional ideas to get not just land care, but our land care projects out there during things like Science Week. I should be out in Alice Springs this week to visit all my Orinda people out there, but alas, I'm locked down in Sydney. That's the way it goes. Now, uh, you may notice some of my adornments are here. There will be a quiz on this at the end, so see if you can pick up some of these things and think about the theme that I will be uh, expressing out of my adornments. Uh, what you may notice is the watering can because I knocked over the vase early and spilt it all over the technical uh, equipment at the back and almost wiped the conference out. But fortunately, uh, I quickly cleaned it up. Well, no, I didn't. People came <laughs> and cleaned it up and the conference has gone ahead. Um, I hope you enjoyed the, 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 the last sessions this afternoon. Um, I don't know which ones you may have been at, Rovering Restorers, or whether you're with David hearing about Gundungra or learning about the Holbrook story or cultural heritage in West Gippsland, the salty feet canopy story in the Hawkesbury or on-farm biodiversity. Oh, I mean, just listen to that little selection. What an amazing uh, range of, of, of um, topics that have been shared. And I was speaking to the facilitators who said, you've really used the chat and there's been wonderful conversations and questions being asked which is fantastic. Um, to close the, the, the conference off, it's one of those things, you know, when you get rolling with a conference and you're very excited, oh, hey, Chucky's gone down. Um, and, uh, and then you, you're, you're on the roll and now we're, now we're on the home turn and I, I'm getting melancholy, getting melancholy because I'm enjoying all my peeps, I'm enjoying everyone and we're rolling so well. But anyway, we, we've, we've got a fantastic panel to close. It's a, it's, a special, it's a special panel. It's the cultural land management panel to speak about integrating indigenous perspectives for better land management. The panel's in three parts. So firstly, there's a film with Doug Human. Now, Dougie, I've been, you, you have been so quiet and humble while I've been mispronouncing your name for two days. <laughs> And I thought I could, I could text you, but I thought it's better to make a uh, public <laughs> recoil of my mispronunciation. So, so Doug Human, uh, Victor Stephenson and Barry Hunter. Doug w had the opportunity to go up on country, as he'll explain. We'll also then have a panel discussion with Doug and Joe Morrison will speak um, uh, along with Danny, Danny Gilbert. But to, to get this uh, final panel discussion underway, I'd like to welcome back Doug Human, who is with Victor and, and Barry and Dani for this panel. Take it away. Uh, thanks so much, Costa, and that's kind of you to, um, uh, to call me by my right name. That's great. Good start. <laughs> Somebody called you George earlier. Oh, I get, I get plenty. Yeah, George, Giorgio, Georgios, Santos, Cosmos, you name it. No, so, uh... you, you can call me whatever you like. You've done a fantastic job. Um, look, I just want to acknowledge that I'm on Gadabanu country on Victoria's west coast and pay my respects to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and their commit, continuing connection to country. Thanks for outlining the purpose of this session, Costa, which is to consider the integration and strengthening of Indigenous land and water management practices with land care and how we further enable that collaboration, which is already and increasingly evident around Australia. Conscious of the likelihood of holding this event virtually, we did uh, go to Cairns a few weeks ago and thought a good way to initiate the conversation beyond these talking heads that you've had the last two days, good looking though they may be Costa, uh, would be to film on country and focus on a, a visible and contemporary issue 
and interest, namely Indigenous fire management practice, and use that as a springboard for the conversation. Just this afternoon, Craig Aspinall said, people are busting to do fire management. And that's absolutely true. And that's why we focus on it. So I'm going to show you the film in a moment, and then I'll introduce those people that Costa mentioned in sequence. We'll take your questions if we've got time. And then I'm really looking forward to Dani Gilbert closing the conference. What a sensational young woman. So before pressing go on the film, it features two extremely experienced practitioners. Victor Stephenson is now well known for his work and teaching in fire management. He's co-founder and board member of Fire Sticks Alliance. He grew up and works on Cape York where his fire workshops commenced and his teaching extends across Australia and overseas. And last year he published Fire Country, how Indigenous fire management could save Australia. Barry Hunter, along with Joe Morrison actually, have helped shape my approach to these conversations over the last two decades. Barry has had a long and distinguished career in land management. He's, this has been demonstrated by his work with the Jabagar Rangers, his chairmanship of the Aboriginal Carbon Fund. He's a leading author of the Indigenous Land Chapter of the 2021 State of the Environment Report. He's a board member of Terrain NRM. Please sit back and enjoy this film for 16 minutes, and then I'll introduce you to Joe Morrison. What we do um, here, Doug, is, is we do a, um, a calling out to country, um, and that's about acknowledging um, country. Um, and in, in, in my language, I, I'll sing out and introduce myself. So, um, so I'm here, I'm talking to country, and I'll tell country who I am. Um, um, and then we're acknowledging country then. So this, these are the homes of the, um, uh, the Bulwai people. Um, and they speak the Jabagai language, um, and near neighbours are the Jabagai and the Nyagali um, and the Gulai people. But yeah, we acknowledge country here today and calling out to it. And for me, it's about, um, um, it's like saying, um, if you, when you walk into those special places that you know, what would you say to that place? And that's calling out the country, acknowledging that country in that way. Um, I think one of the things I think in the approach when we do welcome to countries, or when Welcome to Country is done, is that it's, it's made about people, but it should be about country. So that's where we're just calling out the country here now. Ngā wa jāwa ganji, ngā wa bumbai, ngā wa bulwai, ngā wa nyirama bumba. So I just tell the country that I'm here. Um, yeah, so we've been doing some um, work here over the, um, on, on this property, Kanjini, which is on, um, on Bulwai country, um, uh, near Davies Creek National Park. Um, and we've had Victor working with us and the landholder over the last few years to apply the right fire um, for this country. Um, and the, the work that's been undertaken um, with rangers and, and the landholder, um, which is a cooperative um, group. So Victor's been doing some work with us for the last three or four years around this. Um, so yeah, Vic, what do you think about some of the management aspects here? Firstly, it's just great to be here on Bulwai country and Jabagai country and and um, yeah for me I'm Takalak I'm, I'm another eight hours west of here um, but I grew up in this area here with Barry and a lot of landholders are doing that now these days all over the country they're buying land and they want to look after it and um, I find that all over Australia uh, and a lot of them want to know how to look after it the right way and so for this case these property owners have got the local um, rangers to manage this land for them um, with the fire. Um, this used to be old cattle property and, um, and I think some forestry too. Yeah There's and forestry, area. logging um, and um, as you can see it's just full of weeds and um, because of the past management and basically it was just all full of weed mm. and what we're seeing now um, we put one burn through 
on one side, some areas we haven't burnt, and you can see obviously where we haven't burnt, but other areas where we have burnt, you can see that all the native grasses are coming through, and now we've got more native grasses than weeds that are coming through the country, whereas before it was just all full of um, stylo and different weeds and introduced grasses like the greater grass you see in front of us. And that's the typical for a lot of cleared landscapes where they take out the timber and they deforest it or, and they stop managing it with fire. And so the main goal for this property is for them, they want us to get it back to its natural state. And so the first step is to, is to get the trees back healthy again and to, and to bring back trees where there's no trees. And we do all that with the fire. So this is a great case study on a national scale of showing both private and government sectors working with Aboriginal people and working together and getting really good results. But the, the other interesting thing, I think, um, Vic, about this property is, is the, the range of landscapes. So, you know, we've got that ironwood country and ironbark country up top there and, mm. and mixed tree country and bloodwood down in here. So we're able to apply um, all those different understandings and, and cultural knowledge and apply different types of fire at, at all, all year round, basically. And most importantly, um, it's getting right down to that fine line, you know, of that real, like, perfection of land management using fire and without using fire in places where you don't need fire. And that is um, that fine perfection that Aboriginal people have developed over thousands of years of being a part of that landscape. And that's the connection that we're working from and trying to work people towards again. Mm. And that is about managing the land for food, for um, all the natural plants and all the animals that all tie into cultural affiliation and identity to people and landscapes. And um, when we look at the country that way and manage it the way that um, the old people saw it as, as their greatest asset of all and not mitigation and not hazard reduction and protecting houses, but actually seeing it as food and seeing our landscape as an economy that sustains a cultural connection and sustains a whole livelihood, a health, everything. And not just for Aboriginal people, but right across the board. And So uh, a couple of things that came up there were around fire management as, as one of the tools in the toolkit. Um, and there are other things you can do as well and, and how you balance those things. And how from a, a land care perspective, you, you can engage um, with traditional knowledge to do that. And then the other element is, um, uh, the reference to cultural burning and what constitutes a cultural burn because there's a lot of conversation and people say they're doing cultural burning but they don't have the knowledge of the old people. You know, the old people never used that term. But when I grew up with them and, you know, around other people and um, never heard cultural burning, it was always just Aboriginal fire management, you know, and burning country. Aboriginal fire management is really important for Aboriginal people because of their culture and reviving their culture. It's, it's important about employment and giving our young people direction. All of this is about the aspirations of the elders. Mm. And the elders all over Australia, they want to see their young people managing the land and looking after the land and keeping their culture going. But fundamentally, I think the, 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 the starting point um, is understanding and reading country, being able to um, apply a whole range of different um, land management tools um, and then, and fire is the key there, but you know, being able to mechanically clear and, um, and then set up monitoring plots for cultural indicators is the main work that we're trying to achieve through that, yeah. But I think that's a key point, um, Vic, in regards to when uh, ma ma modern day management practices are about um, looking at country in silos and isolation, um, whereas country needs to be viewed as a whole. And that's what um, indigenous knowledge is, it's holistic. And so when we're talking about country, we're talking about the trees, the animals, the plants, everything, and the benefits, and then even the health to people, and the benefits to education and to employment. So this is about um, that big corner we've got to turn as a nation. That this NAIDOC theme is touched on today, this year is the healing country. What we've got to deal with is massive and um, not only in healing the land practically and looking after country, that seems to be the easy part but the most hardest part is people. And the land care community is about healing country and like mm. you've talked about agricultural productive landscapes right through to you know, the conservation estate, that's the, that's the land care movement. So you're, you're really talking to, to everyone that's a participant in land care, wants to understand how this engagement can take place. 
and, you, and you're starting to see it come together. Like we, we certainly do a fair bit of work with um, our local land care groups. Um, um, but that work um, um, started off around um, site prep and site rehab um, and, and being able to have those areas and in riparian zones um, um, restored um, to what they should be. We've seen that extend into threatened species work. So out of the burning country, um, we found words to songs that weren't, weren't applied until um, old people were out in the country and they were listening and talking and started re, um, realising that, that that was that song that we had been missing for a long time. Um, so being able to apply those things. So culture regenerates, you know, with land as well. It's healing country and healing, healing knowledge as well. Healing knowledge yeah. and healing people, yeah. People are a part of the country and that if you're going to heal landscapes, you've got to heal people with the landscape because this country has evolved with people over thousands of years of burning the right way. And so people have been part of the evolution of the, all the ecosystems. Barry's gonna start the first one here. And so you're gonna sing out there, let the country know, and off we go. Cool. So I'm just saying, I'm gonna go and open up country with fire. That's all part of singing out the country, and that's all part of connecting to country. You can hear the bird sing out then. They're all acknowledging it, see? They're all letting each other know. And all the insects that start climbing the trees now, and things start moving out the way. It's all about food. The right fire for the soils, all the way to protecting all the lives of the insects, so that the birds can eat the insects. That we don't scorch the canopies, so we've got shade and that the trees are protected and not all burnt so that they can continue to flower for the, through the season and continue to seed and continue to give shade. This is a hot country, we need shade. So that's why the fire, we only burn the grass. And here, what used to be weed from last burn we did, now has turned to native grasses and only a little bit of weed instead of all weed. So now we're burning the right vegetation and that's what we aim to do. We burn to bring back the right vegetation. So the only thing we're burning is the grass. Then you can also see the organic matter is still there. Yeah. And that tells you we haven't cooked the organic matter in the soils so that they've got the goodness in there and the seed banks. And you can still see grass seeds in there too. But we've gotten rid of the fuel load. And this is also protects it from wildfire because we'll have green grasses here and not dead grasses. So that's why we need to demonstrate through traditional knowledge so that people know that the fires are gentle and very calm and burn in the right places. So here we are in the river system here, Enmore Creek, and beautiful, beautiful water. And these are the one of the areas that we don't want to burn. And there are many areas that we don't want to put fire, rainforest, river systems, gullies, um, certain ecosystems that um, belong to certain values. And um, this is one of them. And it's really important that people understand that when we do fire management, we don't burn all the country. Next to fire is the water. We should be looking after our rivers, should be taking care of our water systems because it's so important to the health of our landscapes and for our ongoing, um, you know, sustainability in this country. Um, so water, more and more we're seeing being used as a commodity, um, but to us it starts with that cultural value and that cultural value defines our identity. So the importance of water to that cultural identity um, and that identity then goes... Um, and talks to the species and biodiversity and the different um, values within the river um, and water um, is important for our life and our identity um, and, and culture moving forward. So when I see the work that we do um, um, as Indigenous rangers on the ground um, and then I look at 
the influence that it has on um, particular um, the y younger men um, and women that I work with and that are involved in, in the work that we do and the sense of pride that I see within um, those young people um, wearing that uniform and walking around is, is great for their self-worth um, but also great for their, their, um, uh, the way they're perceived in the community and to be able to uh, demonstrate in, in some small way that, that there's a wealth of knowledge and a wealth of uh, views um, and with that comes a wealth of opportunities in the messages as well to be able to share and to be able to come together around those aspects of um, management because at the end of the day the, the goals um, and what we're trying to achieve is, is the same, it's one of the same, there's really no difference. It's been a tremendous honour and privilege to be out here with, with Barry and Victor on Barry's country and to have him welcome us through his ancestors, um, invite us to be part of demonstrating fire in the landscape. And what a wonderful opportunity for Landcare is to be able to see that through this piece of vision. A lot of Landcarers are already working with First Nations people. They've, they've already got fantastic partnerships. What, what we want to see within the Landcare community, I know, because I feel it and, and people talk to me about it, is to take the next step and, and to reach out. And what we've heard from Victor and Barry today is that invitation to reach out. And, and I know when, when we reach out and when Indigenous communities reach out to us that we're going to learn so much together. And it's always the case. You achieve so much more together than separately. And at the end of the day, we're, we're all one Australian community. And land carers are a big part of it and have a huge role to play. You know, for me, I'm a Takalaka man and um, I never grew up in my country. And traditional knowledge was the most important thing, you know, for me. I didn't realise it was a practice that was so far gone right across the, the country in many places. And um, so there's a lot of work to do to bring all that knowledge back. And the biggest message for healing country um, from me for this, uh, for this year is um, we can't heal country if we can't work together. And so there's a lot of reasons why that's so important for our health um, and why the, this is so important for the health of our young people, for their futures, economically, health-wise, culturally, all the above. And, and it's, that's just so important. Aboriginal people have been a part of this land for thousands of years and the land has evolved with people. And it's so important that, um, that people understand that we go with the health of the land and we're a part of that healing process, and you are too. So that vision uh, finished with uh, Victor's uh, music and Victor looking straight down the barrel and, uh, and inviting us in, which is just fantastic. Joe, there's so much in that for land carers. Um, it's vision on private land, uh, Barry talking about understanding and reading country, uh, Victor on the real perfection of land management uh, and all the things that fire provides around healing people and healing country. I'm inviting Joe Morrison to speak. Joe's had 30 years experience working with Indigenous people in Northern Australia, and more recently with Indigenous people globally. He has extensive advocacy, policy, research and practical experience in community and economic development. Climate change, traditional knowledge, carbon economies, water rights, public policy, in Indigenous institutional governance, and a range of other elements. He's currently the Group Chief Executive of the ILSC, with previous roles as Managing Director of Six Seasons Consulting. He was the Chief Executive Officer of the Northern Land Council, and he was the founding CEO of the North Australian Indigenous Land and Sea Management Alliance. Joe's going to take um, a bit more of a, a strategic view, as well as uh, thinking practically about how this relationship can develop. And uh, over to you, Joe, for 
uh, some words from you in the next 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, thanks, Doug. And uh, uh, I appreciate the opportunity to speak to everyone here today. I know that uh, it's been a long week for those attending the conference and uh, and also celebrating too, I, I suspect, the, uh, the winners of the Landcare Awards as well, which show an amazing uh, array of uh, contributions. Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the, the country that I'm on, uh, Wadawurrung uh, people's country here in, uh, in Victoria now. So I've moved from the sunny parts of the country in Northern Australia down to the cold and unfortunately uh, sixth lockdown part of, part of Australia. Uh, but notwithstanding that, uh, very humble. Um, like, uh, like has been introduced, um, I'm from two groups of people, uh, inland people, tropical savannah people in, in Catherine in the Northern Territory and also from saltwater people in the Torres Strait. Uh, but today I really wanted to talk about a, a number of things following on from the theme that came out of that uh, video from uh, old friends Victor and Barry, uh, whom I both work with in Northern Australia in the, in the past. Um, uh, firstly, just kicking off with, the, with the, uh, what I think is, is uh, upon us now, and that there has never been such a good opportunity, I think, for the coming together of uh, diverse groups with diverse cultural backgrounds, knowledge sets uh, and opportunities to shift the nation towards what I think is a new paradigm around the future sustainable living of, uh, of people on this country. And we've seen some extremes in the form of uh, the big bushfires, but also droughts and then floods. Uh, I think uh, for Indigenous people, and certainly in my experience, uh, these things are part and parcel of what we've always called as country. And uh, just noting that the land camp movement, in my mind, in my experience, has been uh, akin to what we've called in Northern Australia and then broadly around the country as, as caring for country. And some of you may have heard that term, but caring for country, in my experience, really started as part of a post uh, land rights determination sort of agenda by Indigenous people uh, once they got in their country back, particularly uh, in my experience in the Northern Territory, then spread throughout other parts of Northern Australia, along the lines of land care where Indigenous people who had uh, deep customary and, and other connections to their estates that they were able to get back in some shape and form and were looking for new uh, economic and other opportunities on those uh, estates and uh, now we know that the Indigenous estate, as we call it, uh, very broadly around the country, comprises uh, around half of half of Australia, uh, and uh, there are enormous numbers of Indigenous people employed as rangers, as some of you uh, no doubt know by now, and also uh, involved in protecting uh, some of the nation's most precious uh, biodiverse. Uh, and culturally diverse areas in the country and indeed in the, in, on the planet, I believe, uh, through the Indigenous protected areas and also through uh, other arrangements such as joint management of world heritage areas. Uh, and so uh, from a global point of view, I know that uh, some of the most intact uh, landscapes left in the world are where Indigenous people have been able to retain some level of uh, connectivity. Uh, these are also the places where there's huge, enormous uh, freshwater uh, systems, um, carbon stores, uh, and also people with customary economies in, in place. Um, and as you heard from, from Victor, uh, the, the story of fire here, which has emerged particularly in the last, uh, I think, 10 years um, uh, by the efforts of people like Victor and others that have been talking up the, the role of fire. And certainly in my experience, fire has been a central feature of not just managing country, but also uh, in ceremonies and, and in law and custom for Indigenous people as well. So it's a very important and powerful tool that hasn't really been articulated all that well by Indigenous people, but we're starting to see that message come through. And you would have seen in that video the, the importance of uh, connecting to country in the way that Barry uh, introduced himself and let what we say the old people or the spirits in that landscape know that uh, that we're around and we're coming to do something on that country. Uh, for me, though, it's um, it's been a it's been a pleasure. I've been very fortunate uh, over the last thirty years to have had a, such a deep involvement with Indigenous people and, and others, including the land care movement in Northern Australia, uh, because it's been fundamentally important, uh, not just from a, a personal and private point of view, but also I think uh, 
uh, from a point of view of uh, nation building. And when I say that, I'm just not talking about Indigenous people. I'm talking about the need, uh, as people like uh, Rick Farley and others started in the land care movement, uh, the bringing together of diverse views of diverse opinions for a common goal, and that is the sustainable occupation and management of this country. Um, and so that's, that's something that's uh, akin to what we have been calling caring for country. Uh, and we know that, uh, and, and pay homage to people like Rick in the past that have uh, brought uh, sometimes warring factions together to think about how do we coexist, how do we work together? And the land care movement has been, just like fire in Northern Australia, the ingredient that's been very successful in bringing uh, different land sectors together to talk about common issues and common threats, but also, more importantly, common, common opportunities. Um, so as land care, I know it started in Victoria, uh, particularly with the farming communities and Indigenous people with caring for country started in places where there has been very little economic opportunities and employment opportunities. Uh, my role, in, particularly in Savannah Fire Management and developing uh, early methodologies for carbon farming and the ability for Indigenous people to offset these uh, emissions from Savannah fires um, has been an enormous opportunity, not just for Indigenous people, but now uh, more, more so non-Indigenous people on the pastoral estate. Uh, and so the blending of both this caring for country ideal and, and knowledge set uh, and also those in the farming community uh, coming together using a common tool, I think is uh, it's been something of a world standout, at least in, in my experience, where I know that uh, in other parts of the country, we're now seeing uh, some parts of Northern California uh, with enormous fires going on in parts of uh, Europe and in also in parts of South America, that there are opportunities to do the same, that is to uh, provide an incentive for Indigenous people and, and the farming community to come together to manage uh, common issues, but also look at opportunities for uh, economies that are uh, non-existent or uh, not able to be accessed, uh, particularly by Indigenous people living in very remote parts of the world. So I think there's some great lessons that Australia is now starting to look towards uh, expanding in other parts of the country and uh, you know it's been very proud to see that uh, Indigenous people have been uh, driving that agenda particularly around fire as you heard from Victor but also from many other senior old people in, in Northern Australia over the last uh, 30 to 50 years have been talking about the importance of uh, this notion of country needs people and people needs country that is having an empty landscape and this view about uh, a wilderness uh, equates to a, a very unhealthy country. And that's, uh, you know, how I grew up, um, that country needed people. Uh, it needed people to be in, actively involved, not just in the biophysical management of country, but also in the performance of uh, customary obligations that Indigenous people have been uh, having towards their country as well over a long period of time. Um, the, uh, the organisation that I'm now fortunate enough to be involved in, the Indigenous Land and Sea Corporation, some of you no doubt know has played a, a significant role in finding some of these new and emerging economies in, in remote Australia and bringing some of these other sectors, these diverse sectors to the, uh, to the table as well. Uh, we're always looking for new opportunities because the Indigenous estate is, uh, is growing. We know that native title is coexisting in much of inland Australia now. Uh, and Indigenous people and pastoralists uh, are looking at solutions, not just from foreign investment, but also local solutions that uh, fit both uh, those orthodox models of uh, managing those uh, parts of the nation where there's low rainfall and so forth, but also looking at how uh, international markets and, and their opportunities could play a role in, uh, in, in nation building as well. Um, and uh, we also know that Victor, you know, Victor talked a little bit about uh, weed control, and that's been one of the fundamental challenges for many land care groups around the, around the country. Uh, fire has been an enormous tool in managing uh, weeds, in, in my experience, particularly some of the more evasive uh, weeds in, in northern Australia, some of the tropical grasses that have been introduced that are taking over waterways and so forth. So there's, a, there's always a lot of work to be done. Uh, and I think that the power of collaboration and the power of uh, motivation, uh, bringing diverse groups together uh, to think about common solutions is, is something that the land care movement has been 
part of for such a long time. And uh, in my experience, the Caring for Country movement is akin to that. And I think it's an opportune time now uh, in, a, in an environment where the economies are stressed uh, to think about how do we mobilise uh, ourselves as a collective around the country to think about new economies that could be about uh, supporting both farming communities, Indigenous communities to come together and work, but also to look at how they can use those economies to build their, build their bridges between uh, both of those industry groups. Um, I won't go on much more um, in terms of uh, what I've done. Uh, so I'd like to hand back to Doug, but I, I think, uh, you know, there is an enormous opportunity uh, here and uh, I'm sure the theme of the, uh, the conference and uh, the spirit of the video that we just uh, observed uh, speaks a lot to the, to the opportunity that presents itself uh, to reimagine ourselves. Uh, and I know that the Australian community is becoming more, more sort of switched on and in tune with Indigenous aspirations, particularly living here in Victoria, where we know that there's a lot of, a lot of very positive things going on. Uh, I think the time's right now for the Landcam movement and Indigenous people to work uh, a lot more closely together. Thanks, Doug. Yeah, thanks, Joe. And uh, yeah, the time, I think you're right, the time is right. Probably the time's been right for a long time. And it was terrific to hear you reference Rick Farley in that regard. I mean, 30 years ago, uh, Rick and Philip Toyne were talking about this and your reference to nation building and building economies um, and that those economy, economies relate to sustainable occupation and management and your theme of country needs people. So, there's so much in what you said, Joe. And we'll um, talk a little bit more about that in a moment. And please, uh, those of you that are watching, keep your questions coming through. I'm uh, marking some up for, for comment as we speak. It's a, a huge opportunity and thrill to introduce Dani Gilbert into the conversation now. Uh, Dani, uh, we missed your vision last night of uh, accepting the Young Landcare Leadership Award nationally. Congratulations on that. Dani um, is also the 2021 ACT Young Woman of the Year. She has a focus on advocacy and activism concerning First Nations people, environment, social justice and climate change. She's doing a double degree at the ANU with a Bachelor of Science and a Bachelor of Environmental Sustainability, focusing on conservation, biology and science communication. And she's doing a graduate certificate in Wiradjuri Culture and Heritage from Charles Sturt University. Dani, there's an image of you in a blog. Uh, you're setting fire to a grassland and the caption says, when I'm on country, my soul feels good. I am grounded, I am connected, I take time to breathe and deeply listen. Dani, you work in the ACT at Mulligan's Flat Woodland Sanctuary and the Jerumbumberry Wetlands. I'm familiar with their work in ecological recovery, in community education and species reintroduction. You're going to be closing the conference in half an hour and I don't want to steal your thunder and I hope we've tic tac enough that uh, you'll be able to talk about some different things now. I'm going to ask you to comment on Joe's remarks and the film short, shortly, but first, Dani, welcome. And can you describe your work in Landcare and what motivates you to be engaged in Landcare? I think what motivates me to be engaged in land care is a really deep love for country that has been instilled in me by my family and community from a really young age. And also understanding the deep connection between country, community, and how that has a really important impact for all people. Uh, in terms of land care and my roles in land care, I'm really lucky in that I grew up doing caring for country practices. So I had that really physical base um, and cultural base from a really young age. But now I've been really lucky to engage with land care on things like helping to get up and running the first land care youth summit, which was held in December last year um, online due to COVID, but also doing some work around advocacy and understanding and promoting young people's role in land care. Thanks, Dani. Re reflecting on those experiences that you've had and the, and the film, which I hope you've been able to see, uh, along with Joe's remarks, can you speak to the opportunities you have now and see in the future for utilising Indigenous land management practices? And in Joe's words, facilitating collaborations between Indigenous landholders and managers 
with the land care movement? I think something Joe and Victor and Barry all really well highlighted really well in their presentations was not using a siloed approach um, and looking at country as a whole and how First Nations people in our intrinsic understanding of country look at it as a whole and I think that's a really big learning place and so I think there's been a lot of opportunities and a lot of shift in conversation around how we manage the landscape and including First Nations people in those conversations because First Nations knowledge is valid, it's legitimate, it's time tested, but it's also suited to the landscape on which it comes from. So knowledge comes from country. And I think that's something that's really important acknowledging and builds a lot of capacity for having relationships around how we look after country properly. Thanks, Dani. Joe, you might want to want to comment on that, but but also um, more broadly, fire is an important tool for Indigenous land management practice involved in connection to country. Would you each like to comment about those land and water management practices which you observe and how those practices intersect, including with the land care movement? Joe, yeah, I, guess, I guess for me, Doug, thanks for the question. I mean, uh, I, I recall uh, various forums that we had in Northern Australia in the last 20 years. One was uh, at a place called Mary River in the Northern Territory. But we talked about water and this, this reality that Indigenous people have that uh, water and land and people are intrinsically entwined. That is, that there's no separation as there is in the Orthodox Western view of the world, that water and land titles are both separated. For Indigenous people, they're both the same thing. And in fact, salt water and fresh water are the same thing as well. So regardless of what it tastes and looks like, it's respected and, and treated in the same vein. Uh, and so that's that's something that's really important. So the, the sort of ideology uh, that Indigenous people have around uh, how they view uh, the country, but also their connection to that country is, as Dani's pointed out, very, very place-based, but also very well uh, tested over, over, the, over the times of, of people living in those landscapes. How I think that relates to, to land care is, is basically the love that people have towards country. And, and I think that's you know, something we don't hear enough about and it's probably can be uh, construed in a very odd way when we talk about love. But I think when Indigenous people, in my experience, talk about country, it's, it's a very emotional thing. It's a very in, attached thing. And it's uh, something that evokes emotion, but also something that evokes uh, a response from country, as you, as you would have seen in the video that Victor was talking about when he lit the fire, that, insects were crawling up the trees and those sorts of things and in my experience with old people in Arnhem Land people always talked about those sorts of things including the brown falcon for example that picks up fire sticks and moves fire uh, when you light those fires as being uh, part of uh, the human uh, so we don't see those those animals and those beings in the landscape as separate to us and I think respect for those things in our country is is also something that I think is also embedded in the land care movement that there's respect for the things that are important, both from a human, but also from a non-human point of view. And I think uh, in terms of responding to your question, that's probably how I could articulate that, that as humans, uh, we are here to stay and we need to coexist with all the living things in this world. And I think it's uh, really important that we respect and pay homage to all living things uh, in the landscape. Thanks, Joe. And Dani, I'm just going to layer on a couple of um, uh, points that have come up in the questions to uh, aid your answering that question about intersection with land care. F Philip says, um, I'm guessing the where, when and what you burn varies all over the country. It's so important to gauge, engage with traditional owners. And Annabelle asks, and this is sort of my lead, Dani, do you think non-Aboriginal people can learn from Indigenous scholars, artists and leaders to understand better ways to collaborate and learn that are more culturally aware for all and inclusive. Would you like to comment on those things, Dani? I definitely would. And I'd just like to say thank you for the questions. I think they're really amazing and cover a really broad range of issues. Um, I guess I'll start off maybe with some of the intersections I've seen with the work around caring for country and land care. Um, so land care, covers a broad range of activities that people do all across the landscape. And a lot of the work I saw quite early on as a, a young kid was particularly around native vegetation 
restoring and tree plantings and removing weeds and works like that, particularly here in the ACT. And so I've kind of see, seen that rep across caring for country activities because as um, Uncle Victor and Uncle Barry talked about in the video, getting rid of weeds is one of the most important ways to care for country. And that's something that land care strives to do, but also First Nations people engage with. Um, as for the question about, I guess, what, when and where you burn, it's definitely landscape based. And that's where First Nations people really come in, in helping to guide those conversations and those practices in saying, well, this is from our deep understanding of country, this is what it needs at this time of the year. And these areas don't need fire, but these areas need more fire. And I think um, Uncle Victor and Bar Uncle Barry definitely touched on that in their video in talking about that this is an area we don't burn because it doesn't actually it doesn't actually need fire. Uh, and then I guess the question on whether we can learn from First Nations people, scholars and leadership and people in leadership, I definitely think we can. And I think they have amazing capacity to provide us with a lot of solutions for how we can move forward in a more just and sustainable way. Uh, just as young people can offer us lots of solutions too, Dami. Joe, throwing back to you, because there's um, a, a lot in your background still today around the economy of, uh, of land management. And, and you were instrumental in, in the setting up of the carbon abatement program in Arnhem Land. I'm, I'm just interested for your commentary about how that's going, uh, other methodologies in the fire space, but other opportunities around economies in land and water management. Joe. Yeah, thanks, Doug. So, it, yeah, it's a great question again. Um, and yes, I did play a, a big role in that. I was a CEO of uh, NAILSMA, or the North Australian Indigenous Land and Sea Management Alliance at the time. And we've seen that there was an opportunity with the global changes to the debate around climate change and being able to uh, account for carbon and other greenhouse gases. Uh, and we all knew at the time that development uh, was coming and, and is here to stay. And also that there's an opportunity uh, in the national accounts for Australia to abate uh, some of the emissions that come from savannah fires in that, in that instance. So we, we had a number of fire projects. In fact, that uh, Victor was involved in some of those fire projects that were supported by the Tropical Savannah CRC. And it was out of that work uh, and working in Kakadu National Park that we realised that there was in fact an, an abatement potential. And so we further did some work uh, with governments and uh, involved the research community. But really importantly, we collaborated with uh, senior old Indigenous people that, uh, you know, some of those old Indigenous people had only walked out of that landscape in the 1940s. And so they were very knowledgeable, very well connected, and knew about the importance of fire and they could see the damage that... Uh, was going on when there wasn't people in those landscapes anymore from bad unmanaged wildfires occurring late in the dry season. So the intervention was uh, using that science to uh, validate uh, the intervention again of Indigenous people being put back into those landscapes and reinstating a traditional fire regime and that showed that there was a there was an offset uh, that could be achieved from a baseline of no people in those landscapes and that's that's the difference that's being sold and accounted for in many parts of Northern Australia now. And so we did the initial uh, work around that with the Carbon Farming Initiative, which obviously has changed since now. But now there's an opportunity to, to look at other aspects, including uh, carbon sequestration and living biomass, and also exporting that knowledge uh, to other parts of, of, of the world, particularly in parts of Africa and similar savannah landscapes uh, in Brazil, in the, lands, in the savannas of Brazil, and parts of uh, North America, particularly in, in parts of California, where there's First Nations people uh, dealing with big fires as well. So uh, that knowledge has been generated out of a small collaboration here in Australia and is now becoming uh, an important story of uh, dealing both with fire as a biophysical thing, but also dealing with the greenhouse gases. And unfortunately for Indigenous people, the most important thing is reinstating people back into that discussion and dialogue about the importance of their knowledge and their place in the management of these very important places. Thanks, Joe. And uh, yeah, the land care movement really looks forward to the opportunity of working more with you on that, on that meta scale that you've just been talking about. I just want to pick up 
a question and, uh, that has the most votes, actually. And I'm just going to ask it, but it's essentially a statement. I'm not going to ask either of you to answer it. How do you get government bodies, this is from Martin, how do you get government bodies to deal with fire and their volunteer groups, brigades, accepting and doing these burns? Actually, I will comment that, that some are doing this already, but it's a, it's a great question. My question to you, Dani, is another one that's getting a lot of votes. Um, I'll just read it out from Fiona. How can non-Indigenous people most effectively be connected to the spiritual and emotional values of their local country, Indigenous custodians and their culture? Would starting in schools be best? Dani. Awesome. Thank you so much for the question, Doug, and also Fiona for the question. I think... Starting in schools is a good place to start because young people and particularly young children have amazing capacity to grasp and connect with concepts in a way that then influence the further community because young people, we often talk um, and when we're quite young, we come home and we tell our parents about what we learned at school that day and we get super excited and we're quite engaged and that encourages a lot more engagement from the broader community and saying, hey, this is something that I thought was really cool. Let's have a look at it some more. But I think potentially the best way to get engaged, or actually I think the best way to get engaged with your local First Nations community is to find out who they are, whose country you're on, who are the, the traditional custodians of that place, because they are the only people who could teach you about the cultural significance um, and that, um, that deep connection to country, because that like that deep connection to country is very place specific. And I think that would be my starting place. While schools is an amazing resource to tap into, I think first connecting with your local mob um, is the best way to go. Thanks, Danny. Did you want to have a crack at that too, Joe? Yeah, I mean, I, I you know, I agree with what Dani said about that. I mean, I think it's becoming quite well known and I know that the sentiment in the Australian communities quite high in relation to embracing Indigenous people, uh, probably out of step with what's going on in many uh, political circles, actually. So I think that there's there's an opportunity for local groups, land care groups, other kinds of community groups to uh, find out who are the Indigenous people of that area um, and start start working with them. In many, many cases, there are organisations established. And if there is a, a native title outcome, there's typically organisations around dealing with and holding those native title rights that have been determined by the federal court. So I can only encourage the land care movement to work at that level with uh, local Indigenous people, because there's no doubt in my mind that Indigenous people in those areas uh, want to work back on their country. They want to work collaboratively with other uh, sectors and they want to uh, feel uh, that they're contributing to something that's important for themselves, both personally, but also collectively from a uh, community point of view. Thanks, Joe. We're, we're, we're winding into the last seven or eight minutes of our session. It's gone so fast. Um, there's been conversation over the conference on many matters relevant to land carers' engagement with First Nations people, including Craig Aspinall this afternoon describing Land Care New South Wales, very excellent program, the program in West Gippsland. And it was noted we should always be aware of barriers for engagement with our land care and within our land care communities. And as Joe and Dani have talked about siloed approaches. In these last five or so minutes, I'm just thinking about that engagement with land care and wanted to ask you both, uh, what comment would you make on any barriers that you observe in the processes or structures uh, within land care or the wider community that we need to overcome and change to enable this conversation that we're talking about? And conversely, what are we doing well? Would you like to go first, Joe? Sure, I mean, uh, I think I've been on the public record quite a bit talking about some of the barriers, but, you know, some of the barriers include uh, views about Indigenous rights uh, and also claims to country and those sorts of things. And I think as we've proven over the last 25 years of the, of the Native Title Act, for example, being around that it hasn't done anything adverse to the, to the uh, broader community. In fact, if anything, it's uh, made us realise uh, that Indigenous people have been here for a long period of time and that they do want to be part of nation building. And that's certainly my experience. Um, and so the, the attitudes that are, are, were around in the last 20 years, I think they're starting to dissipate. Indigenous people, as we know, the uh, ranger programs around the country, which 
I think from my experience, started in remote parts of Northern Australia and are very successful right around the country have proven that uh, not only are these some of the most uh, prolific jobs for Indigenous people, but in fact, they're so important for the nation to meet its uh, international obligations around biodiversity and, and other things, um, and including Indigenous people, their knowledge uh, without having to say so, I think is becoming more and more accepted. Uh, I think some of the other barriers, um, and we've seen that, uh, particularly in my experience here in Victoria, we, we, I could see that there is a, a greater acceptance of Indigenous people's values. Uh, even when you're driving along the freeway, you see signs about whose country it is. And I think that they do a lot of, uh, a lot of good things to overcome barriers about uh, whose country this was. You know, the notion of terra nullius has been dispelled both by the High Court and I think Australian people are starting to realise that Indigenous people have been here for a long time. If you read Bill Gamage's book about fire, you can see uh, untold evidence of the importance of fire and people in the landscape, as well as Victor's book. So I think we're moving away from the justification question and those barriers to now uh, probably looking at, well, some of the barriers may in fact be, well, how do we work together? How do we approach these communities? And they're good barriers in my mind. So I think uh, the nature of the barriers are, are changing. And I think the appetite for a more conclusive, broader community, uh, both Indigenous and non-Indigenous, is starting to come closer and closer together. And we were talking about this uh, off stage beforehand, weren't we, that um, the last three to five years there has been a change and there's a, there's a bit more traction for the sort of things that we're talking about now. And Dani, that's um, in the last four or five years, that's the, the period where I guess your awareness has really come to life. Do you want to comment about the barriers as well, please, Dani? I think um, Uncle Joe pretty, pretty much covered most of them off really, really well. I think when I was first kind of, well, not first coming into things, but I think growing up particularly in um, primary school and places like that, one of the biggest challenges I saw, just not just within land care um, or caring for country, but also within that broader space, was actually the views of validity and deciding whose knowledge was valid. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, you're right. I'll give you a moment, Danny. So take your time, and I can. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll move on while Danny recovers and, and flip back to you, Joe. Um, and I know Dani would like to come back and answer uh, and talk to this question as well. There were many references in yesterday's sessions and again today, Joe, on wellbeing, including by David Lindemeyer, who you no doubt know, um, and thinking about environmental and, and social intersections. Do you want to comment, Joe, on what benefits working on country has and how the impacts of what's happening on country influences wellbeing? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, um, you know, I was, uh, you mentioned that Barry was the, the author of the land chapter for State of the Environment, and uh, I was the lead Indigenous co-author for that. Unfortunately, I had to stop that work and take up this current role, but I think there's now, uh, you know, an acceptance. We've got, for the first time, an, an Indigenous co-chapter of the State of the Environment's national report against its environmental scorecard. Uh, and so those sorts of things, I think, are, are, are trending in the, in the right sorts of uh, direction. And, and one of the critical questions uh, that Indigenous people and non-Indigenous people are always asking is how do we equate the health of our country, whether it's biodiversity or ecosystems? Um, and, and for Indigenous people, as you've seen there, Barry calling out those spirits and letting those old people know that they're coming is, is a part of that well-being. Uh, that being able to practice that freely, but also uh, knowing that uh, it's becoming more and more accepted in society is one of those indicators, I think, for Indigenous <coughs> people to, to speak up about. Uh, and as I said in my remarks, that uh, people have always said to me that uh, healthy country means healthy people. And so the two things are not separated, that people are intrinsically entwined and part of their environment. And when you have a healthy environment, you have a more healthy population of people living there. And Indigenous worldviews, if you, if you treat country in a respectful way, it will look after you. Uh, and so, you know, from my experience, when we've had um, people uh, go to a country that's been vacated for a long time, that's a, that's a level of sadness in terms of wellbeing, that people are sad about the fact that there's no people there. 
and you can feel the presence of old people, but you can't see people there. So it's really important to understand that having people uh, living on their country, right around the country, and I'm not just talking about Indigenous people here, but all people living and enjoying this country is a very much part of how we measure wellbeing, uh, whether it's psychological or whether it's physical health of people, that goes hand in hand in, in my experience with the health of the environment and the, and the place that we're living in. Thanks, Joe. Um, Darnie, people are going to know that, want to know that you are okay. Uh, are you I am definitely that? okay. <laughs> Darnie, um, and I should say that Costa told me that I could have as long as I liked because he mispronounced my name uh, earlier in the session, so we can talk all afternoon. Um, but I hope you're going to be okay for your closing remarks. Can I ask you a couple more questions, Darnie? Definitely. So, did, you, did you hear the, the wellbeing question? Because you helped me to frame that one. Would you like to respond to that? Yeah, I think some of the biggest benefits of working on country are really the mental well-being and the physical well-being benefits. Um, First Nations people have that really deep connection to country and country is intrinsic in everything we do. And so being able to look after country properly and see the benefits um, and the impacts of that is really incredible. And I think... For me, one of the most heartbreaking things when you're traveling out on country sometimes is seeing how sick it looks. And so being able to take part in actions that look after it really raises your spirit and like help make sure it makes you feel good because you're like, this is something that I care for so deeply and it's not doing well. And so when you take actions to make it well, it it ultimately is good for your well-being, but it's it's good for everyone's well-being. Having a healthy country is so important for all people. I was always brought up um, with the saying, healthy country, healthy people. So in order to have healthy people, we need a healthy environment. And I think that's where caring for country comes into play in terms of some of those benefits around health and well-being. Thanks, Danny. I just want to refer to a few things that have um, come up on the on the questions. Um, one is from Eric. Uh, you're right that Indigenous people and land care groups want to work with each other. There are far more calls on our Indigenous community than they can handle. What alternatives are there? Um, the, Craig Aspinall talked about that. It's a great question. Um, as a farmer and landholder, what is the best process to start the conversation? with our local Indigenous community if we are interested in regenerating and revegetating areas. And another uh, really good question for a lot of our land carers, I think, is how can we integrate Indigenous knowledge into caring for urbanised country in our major cities? I'm sorry, we don't have time to answer those, but I just wanted to call those out as slightly different, um, but aligned with what we've been talking about. And, and really go to a closing question to both of you. It's the question about land care in 2030, which I just wanted through the preamble to say the theme of this year's NADOC week was, as we know, healing country. And we hear and know that country is integral to the identities of First Nations people. And this theme of healing country provided Australia with a further opportunity to understand and enshrine those First Nations ways of looking at country in all our land and water management practices, including with land care, and our engagement generally, as we think more broadly of the closing the gap indicators as we've been hearing about in the last 24 hours. Um, Dani, you first, and then you can uh, have a glass of water and uh, get ready for your close. What would you like the relationship between First Nations people and land care to look like in uh, by 2030? I think in 2030, which isn't particularly far away now, I think I'd really love to see the relationship between First Nations people and land care be one of two-way learning, um, where land carers are able to build community relationships with First Nations people that really encourage using um, using that those practices and that deep understanding of country to heal country and look after country in the best way possible. I'd also really love for Landcare in 2030 to have a lot of young people involved, particularly young First Nations people, because I think Uncle Barry highlighted it really well in the video, saying that it is the wish of our elders in our community for young people to be stepping forward and managing land. And I think 
that for me would be a really amazing thing to see in 2030. Thanks, and, and here's to that, Dani. Um, I'm going to let you go uh, so you can prepare and, um, and water your throat and look forward to hearing your closing remarks. Um, thanks so much for joining this conversation, Dani. I'm going to throw that same question now to Joe. Uh, what would you like the relationship between First Nations people and land care look like by 2030, Joe? Yeah, I guess, uh, you know, I, I mentioned Rick Farley and I, I failed to mention uh, Philip Twine, but those two people, uh, much like, uh, you know, a close friend of mine and Patrick Dodson had this vision of, uh, you know, walking together. And I, I think the uh, epitome of that uh, is really how, how can we uh, bring land care and caring for country together? Uh, and I think in, in by the year 2030, we would expect, well, at least I would hope, that people wouldn't see that caring for country uh, as a uh, thing that's unpenetrable, that it's indigenous uh, and therefore uh, can't be equated to uh, non-indigenous ways of seeing and feeling their environment too. But I think uh, more acceptance of indigenous people's uh, uh, rights to their country, but also their ability to contribute to the land care movement and vice versa. So I think, in summary, um, when when people see the the logos of uh, land care, that they would see alongside that the logos of Indigenous peoples from that country, and talking about the caring for country spirit that is embodied in Indigenous people and this long sort of standing connection that people have got with country. And so we don't see those two things as separate, but we see them uh, working side by side uh, with a view of coexistence and sustainable living for our future generations, particularly our, uh, you know, children and our uh, grandchildren. I think it's really important that we turn our attentions to uh, our grandchildren and children uh, coexisting together uh, in this very important part of the world. Thanks, Joe. We'll, we'll bottle those last few sentences and uh, package them up for 2030. Hey, Joe, it's been really lovely chatting to you again. Um, so thanks so much for joining us and two and a half thousand land carers who I hope have still been watching this. Um, Thanks, Doug. I really gonna, appreciate it. I'm going to sign you off, Joe. Um, and Costa, I want to come back to you. Uh, if you wouldn't throw me off the set just yet, please. Okay, I Thanks. wouldn't do that. Thanks, Joe. Costa, I wanted to um, say to you a big, a big thank you for what you've done in the last two days. I've, I've said this um, once before. Am I still alive, Costa? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, there you go. Uh, I've said it once before, but, you know, you've, you've just been wonderful this last couple of days. I have loved your enthusiasm and energy and the way you've embraced and know so much about all the things that we've been addressing and, and the extra you know, thought and expression you've put into that has been truly, truly marvellous, Costa. Thank you, uh, from the bottom of the land carers' hearts. Oh. And I do want to say one more thank you because you you probably won't admit them, but there is one lady who's done an incredibly special job in very trying circumstances for herself over recent months. And that's uh, our Melissa Higgins um, at Land Care Australia. She has been phenomenal 24-7, um, writing scripts for me, helping me, but helping everybody. And Melissa, you have to take a huge amount of credit for this, uh, along with the, the team of, I know, all those techos, who, Costa, got me through that session uh, so I could even read the questions. I could walk and chew gum at the same time. Boom. Um, so th thank you very much. Um, and that's it for me. I'm really looking forward to hearing from Dami, and I hope people enjoyed that session. Thanks, Costa. Well, oh, thank you, Doug, for those those kind words. Look, it's been an absolute pleasure. Um, and, you know, there's still a few more minutes to go. Uh, and Doug, thank you for, for hosting such a, a wonderful panel to wrap up two incredible days. Um, one thing that came to mind as, as I was just standing there before I came back was something that uh, I learnt when I was in Arnhem Land with, with the... Dimaru Rangers, in fact, and uh, they taught me a, a, a comment, which is, Balagalili, we walk together. And um, I think that theme comes through so many of the threads that we've heard from today. And 
Uh, gee, Doug, what can I say about Dani? Articulate, considered and heartfelt. It was wonderful to have you participate on such a special panel today, Dani. And, um, you know, welcome, welcome to, welcome to the, to the, to the end. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the wrap. Thank you for being a part of the conference and and take take it away. Uh, give us give us your your take on on how you've felt about everything that's that's gone on in the last two days. Amazing. You and Adi, Danny Gilbert, Baladu, Diramo, Kalari, Baradri, Mige, Nadu, Winya, Nono, Normanga. Main Dibu, Miagen Dibu, Nigi, Walambu, Wenanga Bilangbu, Main Nadu, Wenanga Doregi, Yalmambili, Guliagu, Nal, Nadu, Yabalinya, Maldon, Walumali, Wirambili, Norumbangu, Main Dore. My name is Dani Gilbert. I'm a proud Lachlan River Wiradjuri young woman. I live on Ngunnawal country. I come from strong, clever people and reflect the teachings they have given me. I study and work protecting and caring for country with community. It is an honor to be closing out the 2021 National Land Care Conference. What a fantastic conference it has been. Over the last two days, we have heard from over 60 inspiring speakers and connected from right around the country. Thank you to the panelists, speakers and attendees for sharing your insights, lessons learned, passion and optimism. Such powerful yarns on so many community journeys to support recovery of country and protect the well-being of the precious lives it supports today and into the future. I have been inspired by the insights generously shared with us all. I'm sure we all have many highlights and takeaway messages. A few that strongly resonated with me over the last two days are Jabogai Nation's work in far north Queensland and the wisdom of Uncle Barry Hunter that highlights that healing country is also intrinsically about healing people, knowledge and having sustainable outcomes for all. Yesterday's wellbeing and mental health panel spoke to the universal value of people's active connection with their environment and community. And this morning, the land care farming panel emphasized the strength of private landholders leadership in using diverse practices that meet the needs of the local landscape. Hearing all these powerful messages has me feeling really privileged to be joining you as the closing speaker. I hope in sharing a bit about my journey so far, I will leave you with some further th food for thought on the power of connection, the wisdom of the oldest continuing culture on the planet and young people's immense capacity and interest in being part of action for a more just, inclusive and sustainable future for country, our communities and all life on this planet. I am incredibly blessed to come from a family and community that actively engage with caring for country. From a young age, I was taught the importance of our natural world and encouraged to view country as a living entity with an inherent right to flourish in order to understand its needs. We often yarn about the siloed approach and about how it isn't really beneficial for looking after the land. I was never taught in a siloed approach. When learning about country and culture, my family and community always talked about the interconnectedness of everything, how every living thing relies on and has reciprocity to another in order to thrive. From a young age, I've been involved in caring for country and ecological restoration work, taking part alongside my family and community members in activities such as seed collection, weed removal, cultural burning, native plant revegetation, and caring for our waterways. Understanding the stewardship, reciprocity, and beautiful relationships between country, community, and community is ever present in the practices taught to me. It has guided me in my studies, my work, especially at Mulligan's Flatwood Land Sanctuary, 
but also in my future aspirations. So at 16, I connected with the team at Mulligan Slap, which is a beautiful, ecologically significant sanctuary in Canberra. It's a highly valued place for the local traditional custodians and the broader community. As a critically endangered box gum grassy woodland, it's looked after and managed through amazing people and partnerships between ACT Parks and Conservation Service, the Woodlands and Wetlands Trust, the fabulous park care volunteers, and the Australian National University. The sanctuary of Mul at Mulligan Flat is the site of some phenomenal species recovery work focused on protecting the amazing flora and fauna, as well as the soil health of our lands, of our woodlands. The species reintroduction program has brought back once locally extinct native mammals to the woodlands and is part of the urgent multi-pronged approach Australia needs to take in arresting the alarming rate of native mammal extinction that we see at a national scale. However, it is also the community education team that really brings all the magic of Mulligan's flat together. Community education builds relationships and connections with our broader community. It creates space for understanding how our precious natural world is and is being committed to protecting it. Community education at Mulligan Flat also highlights the importance of species recovery in making sure we can restore what should have always been here. On a deeply personal level, as a First Nations person, species protection and recovery work is so important because our moiety system and connection to country, plants, animals, songlines and stories, as well as place, have been impacted or interrupted by species decline and environmental degradation. First Nations people have faced unjust barriers to being able to fulfil our stewardship roles in looking after country, in keeping country and ourselves thriving. Despite this, we remain strong and hopeful for change. So when work to bring back and restore our species and environments is done, it brings our communities a lot of hope and creates space for those songs, stories and practices to be revitalised. My elders, family and community have deeply encouraged me to understand this and to be a part of the recovery and revitalization in these spaces. It is with their support I am studying a double degree at the Australian National University in a Bachelor of Science and a Bachelor of Environment and Sustainability, focusing on ecology, conservation biology, science communication and natural resource management, as well as a graduate certificate in Wiradjuri Language, Culture and Heritage at Charles Sturt University. In yarning and sharing this with you, I am hoping that I have highlighted how valuable First Nations deep connection and the power of collective action in creating change. I also hope I've given you a little bit of an insight into how crucial the role young people can play in stepping up and taking action to look after our landscape. One thing I really wanna challenge all of us to be is more inclusive particularly of young people. Young people have immense capacity for action and a real drive to see better outcomes within our community. And one thing I really wanna encourage all of you to do is to connect with your young people, create safe spaces and safe relationships where they can feel that their value, that they are valued because young people have a lot of value to add in their spaces. And the same can be said for First Nations people. I hope one of your takeaway messages from this conference is that we need to step forward in a way that is inclusive, multifaceted and suited across a wide range of things because land care is values in action. It's grassroots action people can take in their communities to restore and care for this beautiful country that nurtures us. As my elders say, Nanada garegu bilagalangu, yandu garebu bilagalangbu, 
Nanagiri Ninyogir. Look after the land and rivers, then the land and rivers will look after you. Dani, thank you for such a wonderful bringing together of so much that's been shared over the last two days. I couldn't think of a, a better way to have, to have wrapped it up. And I, I had a, a few notes here that I was going to mention, but I've got no need to mention those because uh, I want those final thoughts to rest, rest deeply and, and comfortably around what you've shared. Um, thank you for being with us. Thanks for being on the panel. And um, I'll, be, uh, I'll be with you on Radio Drive in about 15 minutes. So uh, I'll see you then. See you then. Thank you, Dani. Wow. What a way to finish. What an incredible way to finish. And you'll probably notice that I have this T-shirt on, which is Junior Landcare. And the reason I had that on was because there is so much for us to gain. And the themes came out so strongly through many of the talks over the last few days. A child can directly influence an adult's perspective on the environment educating kids to educate adults. That was Bangalow koalas. We had the Hastings nature explorers directly influencing adults. And then that next level moving up to that next level of our, our, our youth. And we had intrepid land care asking questions. What do we need to be more re resilient? Land care asks us those questions. Of course, we had Jess Hitchcock and her unheard stories. And then we rounded off with Dani's wonderful concluding comments about the conference. We can work together with our youth to, as was said, work together as a whole and, and move forward. And, and what a wonderful way to complete, to complete the uh, sessions for the conference today. The, um, 2021 National Land Care Conference and National Land Care Awards for those of you that came along last night would not have been possible without our sponsors. So a big thank you to the Australian Government's National Land Care Program to save our species and of course to Gallagher. Be sure to jump on to the website and have a look at our sponsors pages and follow up and connect with them connect with all of our backers so that uh, their reach and our reach together can move forward. Um, on a technical note, I just want to let you know that all the speakers um, that were live and were recorded. So if you missed one uh, and you want to see it and you want to share it, most of all, I think that's really important to share these, these speeches later online. Um, all the videos of the talks will come up in about a week or so once the tech people have prepared them. But the speakers' presentations that they clicked on during their speeches are now live on the Landcare, on the uh, National, uh, no, uh, Landcare Australia website. Um, and also the cultural land management film that you saw earlier in the panel um, the, on film, uh, fire and water, that that is up on the Landcare Australia website as well. And again, I urge you to share that through your social networks, through your groups, and through your websites, of course. Wow, there's so much information there. And go to the Landcare Australia website as your portal. There's an incredible amount of, of um, information that you can share as educators. So jump on there and look, particularly if you're teaching with, with young children, with children and schools, uh, the, the junior land care um, videos and all of the curriculum based work that's being compiled is on the website. So are you inspired to do something in your community? There's certainly plenty of opportunities for you to get out there and do it. And most of all, connect with these groups that you've seen 
and heard about over the last 48 hours. Before we close the event, it's really important that we thank the teams who turned the event from, from what was going to be in person here to a virtual event. Of course, Mel and Shane and the teams at Landcare Australia have done a wonderful job. We also wanna thank some of the people who have volunteered their time over the last 12 months to make this event the success that it's been. First of all, the National Landcare Conference Steering Committee. That includes Karen Walsh, Chris McCulloch, Marg Appleby, hey Marg, Jim Adams, Shane Norrish, and Mel Higgins. Congratulations to all of you. It's not easy to, to steer a conference like this into a nice digestible two-day um, extravaganza that it's been. The Abstract Assessment Panel, who helped put the program together. Uh, thank you for, for bringing together so many wonderful, wonderful projects for us to learn from. The National Land Care Awards Judging Panel. Any judges, respect. I don't have a hat on, so I'll put it on and I'll take it off because any judges, you work hard. And to judge, to judge all of those state winners and to bring you know, one of them up and bring, bring them up for the, for the national awards is, is a tough job. So congratulations to all the judges. And of course, all the speakers here this week, from the plenaries to the panels and the stream sessions, all of our speakers have volunteered their time. Thank you, thank you, thank you for what you've shared, for the connections you've built, and for, for the foundations you've helped add to Landcare in 2021. I'd also like to thank the stream session managers. You would have seen them uh, during the question aspects of the streams. We had Luke Akita, Andrew Scott, Jan Reinoch, Dobri, and Alexi Barnstone. Thank you very much to to those session managers for keeping all of your questions rolling into our speakers and, and keeping everything uh, just moving along so comfortably and making you feel as, clued, as included as you could, even though you were over there in internet land. You weren't, as far as we were concerned, you were here with us. And we hope that through all the work of the tech team that, that we were right there with you. Thank you to the land care organisations who support our land care community. The National Land Care Network, the Land Care Peak Bodies in every state and territory, and Land Care Australia. Now, if you want to nominate someone for this year's awards, which will be presented next year, head to landcareaustralia.org.au. And uh, the other thing, if you have a, a, a paper that you would like to, or an abstract that you'd like to submit, just to get the uh, abstracts committee um, back on their toes. They can have a couple of weeks through till October, but then we'll be taking abstracts for next year's conference. Finally, a big thanks to all of you out there for the work that you do, for the support and the volunteering and the efforts that you put in on your projects. It doesn't go unnoticed. Thank you for helping others to learn new practices and best practices for mobilising people in your community to help you. Connect with youth, bring children along to every event you do. Let's embed land care as early as we can in every community everywhere around the nation. For me, I want to say thank you again for being a part of the 2021 National Land Care Conference and all of us look forward to seeing you at the 2022 National Land Care Conference and Awards. Put your diary, get put this in your diary from the 23rd to the 25th of August here at the ICC in Sydney. And whatever happens, we'll still be beaming, at, beaming it out online for those of you who can't make it. So from Arnhem Land to WA, Tassie to Holbrook, from Wiradjuri country to Bunjalung country, and everywhere in between. To all of you, thanks for being a part of a wonderful couple of days and an amazing awards conference. It's time for me to sign off. 
and we'll see you next year for the 2022 National Landcare Conference. See ya.